are these guys anyway? I mean, that's a question that everyone's asking, Ty. Who, who, who the hell are we listening to? Like, we started, we started this off thinking maybe, best case scenario, our moms would, would be listening to these. And as would it love turns it. Out, and would love it, for, yeah, for and sure. And would love it. Five stars. Two stellar reviews from our respective <laughs> mothers. Uh, but as it turns out, uh, thankfully, we've had some more people listening than, uh, than just moms. So we thought we might do a little bit of a backstory for folks mm-hmm. that uh, don't maybe know us personally, share uh, kind of what we've been up to. Uh, it's worth noting that season one was recorded uh, two Almost years ago, two years. over two yeah. years ago. Yeah. yeah. So we, uh, we decided to do this, recorded like 12 episodes put them in the can, got busy, and then finally circled back. We're like, well, should we do something with these and actually get serious about this? And, and then finally release them over the past um, you know, few months. So here we are uh, recording closer to real time. This episode yeah. will, will air in um, whatever, a week or two. So we want to do yeah. a little bit of background. I don't know, where, uh, where should we start? That's, that's the backstory. But where, well, where do you want to dive in, Mr. Ty? Yeah. I mean, the reason we really wanted to do this, number one, is to go, this is Ty, this is Nathan, this is what we're doing. And we talk so much about other artists in the studio and their trials and their challenges and what they're overcoming. And we try to kind of pair it to how we're doing in the studio and the things that we're working on in our life. But there's so much desert in the artist studio. There's just so much dry spells and dry things for us that things move very slow for us as artists. And so I thought, hey, why don't we just talk about what we've been up to because we need to celebrate the really exciting moments as much as we talk about the really down and low moments too. So we're going to kind of go back and forth over the last two years and talk about things that have happened or frustrations we've had, cool things that have happened to us that were we didn't expect to happen that did, that kind of blew us out of the water. And then things are like, Man, I don't even know how I got here. And this was really hard to even get to this moment. So I, I guess let's start with how in the world do you and I know each other? Let's just note too. So if you're here, if you've been listening to previous episodes for the talk about actual, (laughs) I was about to say actual artists, but sure, historically significant artists. This will be very different. If you're mildly curious about us or what we've been up to or lessons learned, I think we'll have a few takeaways and things that we've learned from our experiences over the last couple of years, then, uh, you know, hang around and, and see if it might be of interest to you. But hey, Ty Nathan, and I, Nathan, yes. don't be so down on yourself. I mean, I think this week <laughs> I remember a phone call where you told me, all right, Ty, take a deep breath, get your cortisol yeah. levels up. Let's That's do right. this confidence. <laughs> That's right. Well, listen, as with most things in life, we're much better at giving advice than we are at receiving it yeah, right. or giving advice to ourselves. So yeah. thank you for that check on Absolutely. the positive self-talk. We'll, uh, we'll circle back. We'll close out today's episode with some positive affirmations yes. that you too can use while you're in the studio and just uh, you know fumbling your way through life like us. So Ty and I know each other from your mentorship program. Ty's Mm -hmm. got a fantastic mentorship program that I participated in in the summer of 2021. Wow. Does that sound right? Yeah. 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 I think it was the second session. Yeah. That's right. Yep. So for me, that was, I haven't really shared, shared my backstory in the, uh, in the art path. For me, that was like six months into my time even making art. So I spent yeah. you know, over 20 years in, in a completely different, different, uh, different space, got a chance to exit that and pursue a creative life full time at the end of 2020. I wasn't sure what I was going to do. Got this studio space with a crazy harebrained idea to just make stuff for a living. Not even sure what that was even going to look like or what I was going to be making. Drove to Michael's one day, said, I haven't painted for, you know, 20 years. Let me see what I can do. So bought some cheap canvases and cheap, uh, you know, acrylics. And the very first day, like the moment I put a brush to canvas, I was brought back to the last time I had painted, which was college, you know, high school. And I was like, this is, this is it. This is all I want to do the, uh, the rest of my life. And so found you, I think on Instagram, participated in your mentorship program, learned a ton. We became friends, stayed yeah. in touch. And that's kind of how this all, this all came to be. So that's our, our backstory. And we have a lot of things, you know, in common outside of, uh, of art as well that we discuss, you know, off, off camera, like y'all don't need to know our thoughts on the, you know, NBA Western conference you know, playoff no. picture. Mm-hmm. Who cares? Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Back to you. I, I've been slugging along at this for a long time. I grew up in a family where my uncle was a world renowned sculptor and raku artist and potter, and he taught in the university system in California. So I was around it all the time. And so I've always had this dream in the back of my head to 
make art, always make art. And my grandfather would teach me about art and I was always had my eyes on art and my parents supported me in it. Parents always supported me in everything, but they always had art supplies. And so I always made art. And so went to art school, uh, but also played sports on a scholarship during art school. So it was that weird, I don't know, a lot of guys called me the MTV basketball player because I was an art guy. And at that time, real world was starting. So there was this crossover of, of life and art and sports. And, but my goal was art my whole life. And so like you, you know, I worked in the job circuit, worked in retail, you know, worked in fashion. I worked in video and film. I've done all these different things to get to the point where someday I could actually make art full time. And I took that step, I think nine, 10 years ago, I don't know. And then just been slugging along trying to figure this out. But I, all that time previous grade school, high school, college, after I was making art, anytime I had the opportunity, I was making art in a bedroom, in a back porch, in a garage, you know, all those things with the dream of someday having a studio and being able to do this. So here we are today and I'm working with artists. I'm showing art. I've got these friendships from art that are just incredible. And we have a podcast where we get to talk about the things we love about art. And for me, you and I said in the beginning, if there's five people or 50 people or just our moms that listen to us, we're talking about art on the phone regularly anyways. So let's just go ahead and record it. So we're going to talk about some things that we've done in the past two years while the podcast has been live. We'll kind of just jump back and forth and talk about some things we've learned and what we're doing and where we're going. And please, as we say at the end of every episode, send us messages, send us Instagram messages and ask us, I don't know, tips, hints, talk about things that you're learning. We'd love to hear. And we are going to do a Q&A episode at some point where we just take questions from all over the world and we just answer them on air. At least one. We might make that a, a regular thing. Even if it's just our moms that ask the questions, I'm sure they'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> Save it for the pod, mom. All right. Yeah, yeah. Stop calling. No, I love that. I think I think we should probably begin by the most significant change in your world, yeah. which is that you now have a hope, a, a budding studio director. Of course, I've yes. got Leo, my studio director, mm -hmm. my, my dog, um, and you have now joined the... Uh, You've joined the club of dog ownership. Yeah, he's we, probably keeping you from making art more than he's helping you at this point. <laughs> Nathan. Yeah. So let's just say since December when we got little Charlie Cash at, what was he, three pounds when we got him, I haven't slept much. So let's just say it's been, you know, a few months of not a lot of sleep and we're artists. So we have a hard time sleeping anyway. So you just impact yeah. that with a puppy who I love dearly and is by my side every second, uh, but who will eventually be my studio director 100%. Heck yeah, that's the best. Where do you want to jump in? Yeah, let's let's jump into maybe our highlight of the last 2 years, something monumental that's really exciting for us, something that's just been uh wonderful to work through and put time into. So you for you, you had your first solo exhibition and your second solo exhibition within the recording of the podcast over the last 2 years. Talk since to me, season one. Yeah. Since season one. Yeah. <laughs> Talk to me about just that emotion and that what did that do to you when you got that first call or that first notice of, hey, we would love to have you for a solo exhibition at the gallery? What was that like? Well, as as anyone who shares their their art <laughs> Um, you know, online knows we get 99% of the DMs that you get or, or messages are, are complete, you know, BS. So once I realized it was real, I had to pinch myself. I was like, oh, this is, this is really happening. Yeah. So, you know, spoke to Taylor at another gallery and uh, saw the space, realized like it's just, you know, it was going to be a, a great fit. And so it quickly went from this sort of surreal sense of, oh, this is really happening to holy crap, I've got seven weeks to make a whole bunch of work. <laughs> so he didn't want to buy um, he didn't want to buy an NFT of your work. He actually wanted to show your work. <laughs> that's accurate. That that is exactly right. Yep. And so like actual physical pieces yeah. hanging on the wall. And so um so yeah, so it, it quickly became like all right, I got to this is exciting, but I got a lot of a lot of work to do in a short amount of time. And so I'm super thankful for, you know, both shows, but especially the first one, the way they really forced me to get specific and focused mm -hmm. around 
working in sets. That's one of the, yeah. that's one of the biggest things I, I had to learn fairly quickly is like, all right, previously I had done and still do a lot of experimentation, Yeah, you know, for anybody that doesn't see my process videos or follow me on Instagram. I use a lot of repurposed material. I do a lot of burning and carving and, and, and breaking down a material, building it back up a lot of steps. I can't knock out pieces, you know, quickly. So I can make a lot of work in a short amount of time, but yeah. they all involve a lot of steps and require right. a lot of space. So for, for me, that first show was really, it forced me to get, to get real focused on working through three to five pieces at a time in sets to continue to move work forward. And I actually, I'm thankful now for my experience with spreadsheets before because yeah. I had, I mean, I actually, you and I have never talked about this, but I have now developed a quote unquote system <laughs> where I've got each piece in process, yep. the next steps that need to happen, how that corresponds to the journaling that I've done about and just listening and figuring out kind of what's next. So it really forced me to, to figure a lot of things out in a short amount of time. Well, and so how many total works did you create? for the show and then how many works were actually curated into the show was there a difference there was yeah so we had after after talking looking at what i already had you know when we decided to to put the show together and and realize that it was going to be a fairly short you know time frame i believe it was four four pieces that i already had done okay that i ended up taking with i made 20 four more in that in that period of time um two months just under and then we ended up, so of those 28 we ended up hanging i think 20 or 21 yeah. and that so and i uh, yeah go ahead go ahead well i drove i drove the work out so right. i live in From minneapolis, minneapolis i drove the work out to denver yeah so there wasn't a, a cost in shipping and in, in, in yeah. sending work that wasn't going to hang anyway so we kind of did the curating um on on site, on site. deciding yeah well, and walk me through just the difference of number one, creating the work in the studio and then taking it to the gallery and getting it in the space and then looking at it in the gallery. Did it hold a new light for you or did it still feel the same? No, it held a completely new light. And I, I, I this is going to sound funny, but I felt like an actual artist for the, for the first time. I mean, there's, there's steps, right? I yeah, mean, of course there's sure. different, you know, steps in, along the way. But seeing everything hang in a gallery setting curated by somebody other than me yeah. who understands, you know, the, the, the work and put it together in a way that, that tells the story that we're looking to tell. So important. I mean, I'll never forget that, that first night that we got done hanging everything and just walking through and being like, wow, surreal. I mean, just blown away, like yeah. surreal. That's the best word for it. Yeah. Man, I, I love that. It's, it's such a challenge to go from. And, and this is for all you artists out there. And, and some of you are either having group shows and solo shows. And some of you are just hoping for the moment that you get into a group show or you maybe have a solo show at some point. And there is such a difference than when you're creating work with nothing on the horizon. And when you're actually creating work for a show and then you finish the show and that work is curated down from what you may have created. And then it goes in the space and you stand there and you get to look at it in the space. Totally. I mean, that's just such a different thing. And not to take us off track, but you, you hit on a really important point that I think is, is pertinent for anybody who's, who's making work, which is moving a piece into a different space in a different light, <laughs> regardless yeah. of if, if it's a show or not. Like, I'm sure you do that as well. But when you move it to a different, maybe you take it home and you, you see what it looks yeah. like during golden hour, during sunset, or you put it in a different, you know, artificial light, whatever it might be. But that's a really interesting way to get to know the work while it's in process, but also appreciate it, you know, once it's done. I actually have a, I don't know about you, I have a similar experience when I edit photos of, of work as well. I, it's weird, but like I, I have, a, I, it, it, it sort of deepens the relationship in a way with, with the work sure. because you're looking at it, you know, so closely yeah. under a, you know, almost a literal microscope. I want to touch on something before we move on to the next thing, because I just think this is for me, it's really exciting to watch because your work was only seen on Instagram. That's it. At that point yeah. in your, in your art career, you were posting things on Instagram, studio process, going through work. And you had some small little, uh, pockets of artists community, uh, online and in different areas where you would discuss your work and others work and things. But you went from just people seeing your work on Instagram and getting just those comments that are all photog a photo of the work or video of the yeah. work to actually being able to witness people talk about your work in a room in front of it. How amazing was that feeling? 
Well, and just to, just watching people experience the work in person. I don't, it doesn't matter what what type of work we're talking about. It always looks sure. better in person. But well, it should, unless somebody's should, yeah. really docking stuff up with Photoshop. <laughs> it better look. If it doesn't look better in person, then you're you're doing a Go little bit to too much studio. in the uh, Photoshop there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I think especially because of the nature of, of how textured my work is, that first show, most of the pieces, almost all of them had a pretty large differential in depth between the outer layer and the inner layer. If people yeah. care, go look up my, my Instagram, whatever. But there was, because of that difference in depth, the angle, you know, made a big difference in terms of like what was visible on that inner layer versus the outer layer, the texture, the, the, you know, intensity and angle of the light makes a huge difference as far as how that texture sort of presents itself. And so, um, yeah, just, you know, watching, you know, during the opening, you know, the, the rare moments when you get to take a breath and kind of take a step back and just look at people looking at your work the same way they do when you're looking at other people's work, right? And when you're in right. a museum or when you're in a gallery, that was a really fulfilling moment. And it's something that I, I, I won't forget. I mean, I remember telling my wife, like, as, uh, as we were leaving from um, the, that, that night from the opening, just looking back, you know, from the street. Yeah. That was a really cool moment. I'll, I'll share this story. So we were leaving, said goodbye to, you know, to everybody. Uh, last ones to leave, took some, some photos with the, with the family. My wife and daughters came out for the, for the opening and stuff like that. And, and so we're, we're walking out to the car and just looking back and seeing, you know, my name, the name of the show on the gallery wall, looking in and seeing, you know, some of the bigger, you know, feature pieces that we had put on the, uh, on the wall that faces the street and thinking back to all the times that I had walked past galleries, you know, when you're in, especially when yeah. you're in a downtown area, you know, we've, we've had a chance to travel a fair amount, you know, you, you walk past galleries, you know, and if they're not open or whatever, I, I anyway, just, you know, peek in the windows and, you know, look at like, so to, to, to have that experience and have the art on the wall be mine and the, 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 the name on the, you know, by the door be mine was surreal. Yeah. You know, that's probably one of my favorite things I, I have a lot of people that I keep in contact with on Instagram who I've never met, right? It's your, your Instagram artist friends, you know, that you've never met, but you talk about stuff. And I, yeah. my favorite thing is when they're sending me photos from their first show or even their second show or whatever, just being able to, I was in a conversation with an artist in Santa Barbara just last night who has a solo show coming up in April and I have family in Santa Barbara. So we had talked about the next time I go visit, we can hang out and he's got a solo show coming up and I can't be there cause I'm out of the country, but just the fact that we get to talk about that and celebrate it. And I cannot wait to see his photos of his show because I know how difficult it is as the artist, you're in your studio or in your garage, wherever you're working, just slaving away at trying to create something that jumps for somebody else to take a chance on you with. For some of us, that takes a long time. For some people, it's a short time. But for all of us, the time and amount spent making the work is far far larger than the time that take, you know, when you get a show, it lasts like that, it's gone. And then you're back in the studio for six months, four months, a year, whatever. Then yeah. you get another show and it's over in a month or yeah. a week. Or if you're starting out, it's over that night. You hang it Friday and it's down Saturday. I've done hundreds of those. They, they are a beating, but you're showing work and that's the key. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting too. You think about, you know, we we spoke about this, I think, in our last episode on on Clifford Still, the, the low moments. Yeah. And, you know, I have I had a couple, you know, be careful what you wish for <laughs> moments sure. too, where it's like, okay, cool. You have this opportunity, but those, you know, 10, 15 hour days, which from my previous life I am sort of conditioned for. Yeah. But boy, it's a different thing knowing that the deadline yeah. is you putting pieces of yourself. <laughs> into a wall, into a space and knowing that it's going to be, be seen and judged, yeah. uh, critiqued, you know, taken in by, by other people that there was a different type of stress than I had, had experienced before. Yeah. And so thankfully for, you know, this, this, the second show, I was at least prepared for knowing that those moments were going to come, which they right. inevitably did. Of course, you know, hearing myself, whatever the, the inner critics say, yeah. there's no way this is going to be ready. You're not, it's not going to be done. It's not any good, blah, blah, blah. Sure. And just realizing like, this is just, this is part of it. This is, this is part of the process. And, um, everything is, it, it it's, it, it will be exactly what it's, what it's supposed to be. You know, when it's, when it's yep. all said and done, that was, that was, uh, was very, very helpful. So for the second show, yeah, I was definitely more prepared for 
everything that was going to go along with it. Um, we've talked about this off, whatever off camera, but I think it's it's worth you know hearing your input on this. I'd like to hear how many shows you've been a part of now is my first question. The follow-up question that I'm super interested in is, are you ever like totally ready uh, two weeks beforehand? <laughs> or is it always uh, on your way out the door, those last you know few weeks being 80 hour weeks? This is the thing. Because that's that, been my experience both times. It's been yeah. Like, and you and I talked hey, honey, about. I, I live 10 minutes from the studio, but I'm going to be sleeping here tonight. <laughs> right. And you and I talked about this leading up to your first show is you do the best you can in the moment you have. And you take everything you learn from that experience to make the next one better. And yeah. especially as we're starting out, I mean, this should be, this should be our motto for everything we do. But when you're first starting out, you don't really know what to expect each time. And so you just need to do the best you can then. Otherwise, you're going to stress yourself and have expectations that you're not going to be able to meet. You do the best you can for that exhibition, for that show. And when you go view it, when it's up, now you take notes. Now you yeah. figure out what I need to do different next time. Do I need to prepare more time, which we all need to do getting ready for the show? But you kind of look at those things. And, you know, this comes in play in doesn't matter if you're showing in a museum or showing in a gallery or showing in a cafe or a restaurant, take mental notes of how to improve each time. And so I, I mean, this is a good segue into, into one of my recent shows this year um, because I led into what do I do? I'm finishing things right up to the deadline and maybe I hit a stride, which I did in the last two weeks of new ideas that I wanted to put in the show. I had my first small museum show this last year. That was a two person exhibition with my, one of my closest friends in the world, Vino, uh, Vietnamese American artist from Austin, Texas. We're basically brother, sister, twin to the hip. I, I love her more than anything. And we were asked to do a two person exhibition together. And the space is massive. Uh, there's one, two, three, four gallery spaces within the museum, a big hall, two side spaces, and then a massive backspace. So wow. we had, I can't remember when we learned about the show. It might've been at the end of 2022. And then we had maybe six months to create work for the show. I think is about what it was, maybe six months. Yeah. And so we were going to kind of pair new and old work with, with the exhibition. And V, who is a physician, she's a doctor at a hospital uh, in pediatrics in Austin, has a lot less time than me. And she also has two kids. Uh, she to create that much new work for her is that's a tough challenge. I mean, right, talk about a right. powerful superwoman. V is it mm -hmm. as an artist, as a mother, as a physician. I don't understand it. I couldn't do it. She is a champion. So that's just to celebrate her as well for that. But I decided I'm going to create all new work. And I'm going to do some things I haven't done before with sculpture. And I wanted, I've been wanting, we've talked about this. I've been wanting to do a large yeah. scale sculpture for a number of years, but I've been number one, afraid to start. And so therefore I haven't done it for years. I've just sketched right. and thought of ideas. And so V and I got together, walked the space and then decided let's come up with a title for the show and what we want the show to encompass. And then we'll make work. And so we spent some time uploading songs to Spotify to create, to find some lyrics because music is a love language between us. So we made probably a, a playlist of about 40 to, no, it might've been about a hundred songs that we were going through lyrics and we both landed on the lyrics from the David Bowie song changes where he says, I watch the ripples change their size, but never leave the stream of warm impermanence. And so the days float through my eyes, but the days are still the same. Ch -ch -ch changes. And so we went with of warm impermanence for the style of everything is always changing. And we both have had things in our lives from trauma to healing to her being the daughter of refugee parents from Vietnam and her life growing up in an all white community in Pennsylvania as a Vietnamese female. And so my going through trauma and youth and all these different things, we kind of created how we're constantly changing in life and developing and creating newness out of things. And so we went to work on the show. <laughs> so you, you actually answered the, the, the biggest question that I had as, as you were talking, of course, you know, following you and, and now being a big fan of these work as well and, and seeing how it all came together was really interesting, but I was curious and, and still am. Maybe if you could speak just a little bit more to what it's like to put together a show of that scale and, and type, 
with another artist in keeping. So I guess just kind of, kind of carry that through. Like, so how did you then take the title, yeah. those lyrics and just make sure that aesthetically without the backstory, just walking in. And I know that it was in my opinion, very successful because it, it definitely looked as though it was supposed to be the, you know, the way that it was, but how did you achieve that just from a visual standpoint? So I think number one was trust. I think that was the key thing. It's very rare that you get to have a group show with artists that you know and have developed work with and been a part of their creation for a very long period of time. So for about 10 years, V and I have been showing together, looking at each other's work, talking to each other about our work, seeing each other develop, done things. So there was a massive trust component. I knew her work was going to be strong. She had faith and trust in my work. We didn't see any of each other's work up until we brought it up to curate the show. And it wow. flowed so beautifully and so magic. I mean, it was almost supernatural when we started throwing all of the work around for our friend, Dr. Jane Dameron and Morgan Earing to curate the work. We kind of stood around and we're going, oh my gosh, how did this work so beautifully? And I think it is an absolute trust component, Nathan. That's amazing. I think, you know, you, you brought something up to, um, we, we both kind of spoken to it, but I think, you know, as we try to continue to pull out the, the, the useful tidbits and the useful threads, yeah. you know, one of the things that the, the stress of the deadlines around preparing for, God. you know, a show it's stressful, but it's also very useful. Yeah. I'm going to speak to the, and I, and I'm, I'm curious yeah. to, to hear your thoughts on this, but I found it to be, I find it to be very helpful in, in sort of sharpening the scalpel of editing, right? Yeah. You know, what, what stays, what doesn't. One of my sort of mantras in the studio is, is show your work. Mm -hmm. I want for the, the, the dirty, messy, yeah. you know, marks, the, 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 the bits that are, that are gritty to, yep. to still show. And I, I know, I know you do that as well. And so the timeline of knowing, hey, there's a deadline for this. I don't have the luxury of sitting with it for days, weeks at a time and, and figuring out, you know, what the next little step might be. While again, while stressful is also very helpful in moving the work forward. And some of those little moments that at the time actually felt kind of rushed where I was like, I don't know, end up in some cases being some of the most interesting and um, I think successful pieces that, that I personally made. Yeah. I mean, Jerry Salt says the artist's best friend is deadlines, I believe, because there's finish the damn thing, finish right? it. There's pressure that's yeah. pushing you in a good way to finish yeah. and not overthink because usually when we overthink, we screw it up a lot of times. So I love the deadline. I wish I had more deadlines, even though I get really stressed out, you know, that just that, let's say more anxious than stressed where I'm just really kind of shaking a little bit like, yeah. oh my gosh, can I get this done? But it almost pushes me to create things I might not have come up with if I didn't have the deadline. Yeah. Well, and there's nothing like a real deadline yeah, to, to, absolutely. to accomplish that. But we can sort of manufacture some self-imposed deadlines yep. to prepare for that. I mean, I, I guess I could be curious if that's something that you advise your, your mentees about. But And I feel like I've heard you talk about this before, you know, conditioning yourself to be able to you know, when it's time to, to really, to really go for, for an intentional purpose to, to whatever, just get used to setting a deadline and sticking to it, even yeah. though it's, it's just one that you've made for yourself. In that, one of the things that I tell young artists all the time, not age wise, but career young is create work like you're creating for a show. So don't just yeah. go in there and just kind of half-ass a piece here and one here and one here. Like think through what a body of work would look like in a space and create with the goal of it going in a space on its own at some point in your career. For me, when I started doing that, that's when ideas really started to flow. That's when things really started to jump off the canvas for me when I started to create as if I had a show coming. If that makes sense. It does. Let's, um, I want to hear you talk more about the work from that show and other shows that you've had, you know, in the meantime, let, 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 let's get into the work, you know, how is, how is your, um, work evolved and moved forward in these last uh, couple of years? What have you learned? You know, what are, what are you really excited about moving forward? Yeah. I mean, I, I had a show, so both my museum show at art center Waco and a solo exhibition I had at Vaughn gallery in Austin in January 23 had some experimental pieces in there. And as I've been working on developing with my 
uh, use, use of cardboard for transfer prints with all my work and painting with my hands and texture and things, I had for the first time shown pieces where I use canvas to sculpt on top of canvas in my show at Vaughn Gallery. Now, some of it I feel like was successful and others I'm like, oh, I could have done that better. Oh, I should have done this. But I did 38 total works for that show and we curated that down to 26. And so moving from that show into a show six months later in the museum, uh, I was going to show a mix of work, but I thought, what better to grow than to force myself to do all new work for the museum show. So I ended up creating yeah. 26 total pieces with five sculptures, 21 paintings that range from 10 feet to four feet with an eight foot by 16 foot sculpture installation as well on that. But all yeah. of the solo show work is what really pushed me into ideas for that show in the exhibition. Well, and you hit on a good point too, which I think is is uh, was a very useful takeaway for me, which is you don't really know if you're ready until you just jump in and, and do it. There's, yeah, there's no way to. of like, there's no there's no metric for like, okay, I'm I'm ready, you know. Yeah, you just got to jump in and put yourself uh, out there and put your create a situation again, even if you got to create it for yourself, where you have to sort of you know put yourself on the line and and just and just see and and you'll yeah. learn, <laughs> right? Well, and let's um, okay. I want to jump into a learning thing here because you had with your recent show, you had a new learning experience for your art career, which was an article in LA Weekly. And yeah. whether you've done articles for other things in the past in your career stuff, like being able with a reporter, a journalist to talk about your art and talk about what you're doing and talk about all these things that we talk about all the time, but to condense that <laughs> down right into an article that flows yeah. enough, that's exciting enough to explain your work, explain who you are, why you're making your work and about the upcoming show that was a learning experience for, for you as well. And I want to celebrate because that's exciting. I'm excited that you got to do that. Thanks. Yeah, it was, it was, it was fun. A little nerve wracking because it's one thing to have sort of this long form like we do to like work our way. And you and I are both, uh, um, how should we say it? Neither of us is real, you know, precise with short <laughs> thoughts or phrase. Yeah, we can get to talking, which is great in a long form setting, you know, you yeah. can, you can get it out and, and, it, and it's great. And, and having been a, you know, a guest on podcast telling my story, You've got the space, right? But sure. in an article where obviously they've got a limited amount of real estate that that the this, this feature is going to take up, limited amount of words to work with, it is a little little uh, nerve wracking and curious. Like, how is this going to turn out, and what what is the finished product, you know, actually going to be? But I was very happy with 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 how it turned out, and that was a it was cool. It was just a, a really neat experience for sure. And I think if people just searched Nathan Turborg LA Weekly, they could find that article it would pop up on Google. It should. Okay. Yeah. Do we, do we link stuff in the show notes? Yeah, we can link it sidebar? in. Uh, yeah, we can link that article in the show notes and link it on YouTube as well. I'll probably do a, a video on YouTube of it scrolling and show, you know, but yeah, we'll link it. We'll figure it away for people to, to be able to check that out. Which is something else for season two. If you're a listen only person, we do put these, the videos on, uh, on YouTube. Yeah. So go check it out there. Yeah, if definitely. You are, if you are so inclined. All right. <laughs> We just did a really bad job of like yeah, even mentioning that. I, I think. Oh for, yeah, we're on YouTube as well. Season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something that you said as well, Ty, about the ex the experimental stuff. Um, this is mm -hmm. one sort of like lesson learned for me, and, and an interesting takeaway that that was really important for me to really wrap my head around, which is that what feels extremely experimental and different to you, to the the individual artist yeah. who's creating it still looks like your work it's it's yeah. not as different to every other sure. set of eyeballs looking at it as it is as it is to you that was a really helpful takeaway for for me to 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 really arrive at which is like okay this feels like i'm way over my skis and trying something completely different and then i would share it with with you or somebody else and say does this does this even fit right does this does this yeah. flow with everything else that's going to be in the show and they're like yeah totally i can absolutely tell that that's that that's your your work so to you, like when you talk about the experimental stuff that you worked into, you know, the, the, the different shows, has that been your experience, you know, with, with that show? And I guess just even, you know, in general as well. You know, it's, it's been a really interesting experience because some people weren't ready for such a change and some people absolutely loved the change. Right. And we talk about how don't listen to the audience, make your work period. But yeah. we do need to put it out to the audience and see how the audience responds. Now, that doesn't mean that you listen to the audience when they respond. 
right? Because yeah. the audience says no, well, they just may not be ready for it yet. And so keep yep. working on it. And then on the other hand, if everybody loves it, well, is that the right, right audience that loves it? Is it the Nard audience or your Instagram followers? You know, is it your mom or is it an actual art critic? Those things. So the audience is always a difficult one, but I just, I got to the point where I said, I've got to try these things because they're in my head and I worked yeah. them out to where I felt comfortable enough with showing them because there's plenty yeah. of them I was not comfortable enough with showing. So I didn't show them and they're still in my studio or I've ripped them apart and started new stuff on them. So at the end of the day, you want to be comfortable enough with showing it and not taking a risk of this really looks bad. I'm just going to go ahead and try it anyways. And that's that that's that uh, honoring of the muse, right? Sure. That Pressfield talks about or a lot of different things that uh, that Rick Rubin talked about in, in, in his book that's come out since since we recorded season yeah. one. But just that idea of like the that, that the the idea the inspiration the the thing is coming to you for for a reason and it's our responsibility to do something with it yeah doesn't mean that the thing that we do with it is going to be the next thing right. that's on the feature wall when you walk into you know the the next show but it does mean and this is one thing that i that i found as well like in, in preparing for these last couple of shows is that I've got a whole, I've got stacks and stacks of, you know, failed experiments. Well, I guess we'll call them studies. They weren't necessarily meant to be, yeah. <laughs> meant to be, but they are all little clues and little, um, what's the word where you bury something. I'm trying to remember excavation. You know excavation. what I mean? No, no, no. Where you like uh, a little time capsule. Oh, time capsules. It's a little, yeah. but, it, but it's something that captures the idea in a way that, that it doesn't have to be successful as an individual piece. But for me, that's my little, my little reminder. That's my full scale post-it note. Like this is something that may or may not be worth exploring. And something else that, that uh, something else cool that's happened in the last couple of years. And this, this actually is a, a lifelong dream that came through it, uh, came true rather is that I had an artist reach out uh, a musical artist reach out and ask if they oh, could yeah, use yeah. my art for, for, an album um, cover. for the cover of, of an album. Yeah. yeah. And that was incredible. So I'll, I'll share that story and then bring me back to how I got yeah. to the, so I, actually I've got it. I've got one of them, one of them right here. So this is, I've got a frame one as well, but this is a, this is a piece that I did a couple of years ago, yeah. but like they did a really good job with the album art. This is a shout out to, chaos log out of berlin this is like hard melt your face techno <laughs> but what they did with um with the album art and it's a it's a two it's a two album set you can see different images Love it. They, they they did some really cool stuff with the with the photographs and, and with the images and a little a little book as well this could be a whole side tangent but i'm curious what was one of the most impactful pieces of album art that you remember seeing early on where you're like, oh, music isn't just about what you hear. And it kind of oh, is now that's easy. because of how we're consuming it. But That's easy. Magical Mystery Tour uh, by the Beatles. Mm. That was one of my favorite albums as a kid. My dad had the record and it was a book. And and yeah. it wasn't the yeah. it wasn't the because it had graphic images of colors and kind of stars shooting out with the with the band, you know, on the cover and the colors, but it was more the performance yeah. aspect of the the booklet inside of them in costume and running around in the hills and doing things and the way that the music married that book within mm. the vinyl to me as a kid yeah. was just phenomenal. I mean, that's yeah. a big one for me for sure. So for me, it was uh, one of the first albums that I, that I bought. It was um, the downward spiral by nine inch nails, mm -hmm. that album and the, the music as well, but the, the art inside of it, so Russell Mills is the name of the artist that did all that, all that album art, but I'll never forget, you know, being early high school, maybe eighth, ninth grade and like flipping through. So for the, for you young kids that have only streamed music before there, there was a time we needed to go physically, <laughs> physically buy albums <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, either, you know, records or, uh, or CDs in this case that, you know, you pull out the, and you'd read those lyrics and you'd look at, but I'll never forget the experience, um, of looking at that album art. So anyway, so, so when this opportunity came up, I was like, yeah, absolutely. Yes, please. Yep. And so I've got a couple copies of this record that they were kind enough to send me. One of them's framed and the other one I... Uh, just kind of sits awesome. around, but that was, that was really neat. My point, wow, bring myself back. Look at that. Is that this piece that I did, I think 
maybe late 21, yeah. let's say, maybe, early, I don't know, maybe early 2022, but it was one of the very first experiments that I made. I'll look at my studio director saying, what's up? Hey, Leo. <laughs> what's up, dude? I must have made a mistake. I must have said something wrong. He'll have to correct me later. But that was one of my first experiments with tarp, with repurposed billboard tarp. Yeah. And it's something that I, I am really proud of that piece. I, I like how it turned out, but that was definitely in a, I'll say a, a season for me where I was just trying every single piece was a brand new, you know, adventure that in many cases had very little to do with the one that had come before it. And so this is a great example of like, I had that thing a physical reminder of what I had looked back at. And actually when this opportunity came up, I was like, man, that tarp is because I, I pulled out the piece that was just you yeah. know, sitting and hadn't had, had, had and sold. I had it just, you know, whatever stored away. But I was like, man, this tarp's a great material. Let me, let me revisit that. And that then became a couple years later, what made up, I mean, th th there's a, a version of different types of, of tarps, landscaping, billboard, you know, other materials that makes up I mean, there's at least a shred of it in probably 70, 80% of my, of my current show. So point being, when the idea comes, try it, set it aside. Doesn't mean you need to like dedicate the next nine months of your, of your, you know, making time to it. Um, but just know that if it's supposed like a boomerang, if it's supposed to, if it's supposed to come back, yeah. you know, it will. But I think the, the important thing is doing something with it when it comes. Absolutely. I'm not somebody who's going to write an idea down because I don't know about you, but when the idea comes, it's just a, Hey, try this. It's not a fully formed thing that I could just write out and say, Hey, right. You know, revisit this down the road. I, I need to do something with it and then have that for later. Love it. But what about you? I know you've had some really cool things happen uh, over the last couple of years we haven't talked about yet as well. Yeah. I mean, there's been some things that have been really fun. And I think for me, there, there was a moment last year where I was really down. Work just didn't feel good. I'm prepping for the museum exhibition. And I was just really kind of like frustrated with where things were going. And I was working with plaster and wire and all these things on canvas and it wasn't working. And honestly, you know how you feel in those moments. You almost want to throw the towel in and go, why in the world am I doing this? And I get an Instagram message from uh, another artist overseas that says, Hey, they talked about you on my favorite podcast yesterday. Did you hear it? But he never sent the link. And I went, well, what podcast is it? Where is this? Who's talking about me? I want to know. So he sent me the link. And it's a it's a podcast from the UK that is with the comedians Joe Wilkinson and David Earl. And it's called Chatabix. And I had not heard of it yet. And I'm now addicted to it. And I laugh so hard. And these guys have been in films with Ricky Gervais. And they've had indie films that have been very successful. They're two brilliant brilliant comedians yeah. and actors and writers and lo yeah. and behold on this podcast they had one of my favorite people on the planet russell tovey from the talk art podcast this day and they talked about my work and it was yeah. one of those things that when i listened to it i was in tears i was on the floor i just needed a lift and i know that they probably don't know this but it lifted me so much to just go okay i'm doing this for a purpose and I'm doing the right things. Yeah. Oh, it was insane. So any, any, any chance you get to make somebody's day, just do it, you know, go ahead and yeah, take it. Do it. Yeah. Do, do, do that. Can we, can we listen to yeah, it? Yeah. Let's, uh, can we, yeah. um, I, I've heard, I've, I've, I've heard it, but I'd, I'd yep. like to be refreshed. Let, let's put it on. I, I've, I'm going to be in tears just replaying that day. Cause it was so emotional that here we go. Paul, but Russell, I knew was, I've put two, I put two, sorry, I put two, um, bits of work in zoom. And this yours? is yours. No, no, no. This is someone I adore. Oh. Why do I adore what he's doing? Oh, that's cool. Have a look. He's called Ty Nathan Clark. Why do I love it so much? I do love the fact... Do you, like the, do you like the text in it and stuff? Do you like Cy Twombly then? Have you seen his work? Yes, yes. I love so, Cy Twombly. So there's like handwriting in there and then he's crossed it out. So I guess that you're... Oh, you I've like done these... some handwriting on mine and, and just thought... But he's just copying that guy. But that's all right. But then, but the, all it? artists, co all artists copy artists. That's what yeah. happens. Yeah. So but that, then you evolve, don't you? As well, then you find something you like in it and go, "Oh, mine's a bit different now because I'm doing that." And stuff I like. love Ty Nathan Clark. I really love his work. It's a great photo of him in the paint as well, though, isn't it? He yeah, looks part. He looks part. He looks part of the painting, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah, I think you like it because there's. 
it looks yeah, simple, but there's so much depth to it, and it's, it's quite like, child, it's co- childish, childlike, or childlike, you know? yeah. And it's yeah. it's coded, isn't it? So a lot of you're getting messages in there that aren't you aren't privy to, but he's trying to tell you something, but he doesn't really want you to know because he's crossing them out. And that's mm, you know our, our, within yeah. an art work, you can code so many yeah. things that you are unaware. You know, there's so many artists that have made work, like Keith Haring, for example, or, or an artist called David One Year Old. I'm emotional. My heart's beating. I've got I mean, tears it's... welling up. I mean, I'm, I'm seriously, I'm about to lose it right now emotionally. Like these are those moments that, give me a sec here. These are those moments where the days that suck and are horrible and you throw the work out and you just don't want to do it because you don't feel like anybody's ever going to recognize it. Nobody's going to see your work. Nobody wants to buy it. I have this big show coming up and the work's going to look like shit. These are those moments that just hit you right in the heart and you go, thank you for giving me that sign and that notice that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And they're rare. They're very rare for artists. So for me, that was one of those moments where I just, I fell on the floor of my studio. I was stretching work the days and I was just like, what just happened? Yeah. Yeah. It's not every day that you get compared to, uh, Cy Twombly and Keith Haring in the same sentence. I mean, I, I have no I words. Mean, maybe it is. But... No, no. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, that was so cool for me to hear as well, because I think that, um, I mean, just, well, let's just talk about the, 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 the beauty of the question of why do I, why do I love this? Right? Why do I adore this? Right? You know, yeah. it's just like, so, so to what I, what I hear knowing you, knowing your work and the experience of, of, of you in it, what I hear is I'm, I, I want to know why I love it. But the most important thing is that I love it, mm-hmm. right? Like in the context of this conversation, having listened to the whole podcast, you know, he was asking somebody who was as or more experienced, you know, and, uh, and knowledgeable about, yeah. about art in general. Uh, why do I, what, you know, why do I love this? Which the subtext is, why do you love yeah, it? Right? right? So when the response was, was in kind, that was really, really cool. And I think that to be seen, I, I'm going to go out on a limb here. You can tell me if I'm, if I'm correct or not, but I believe that one of the things that made it so impactful, I'm guessing is that you felt seen as well Absolutely. when they talked about the, the coding, you know, him trying to tell you something, but not, you know, telling you explicitly, right? right? Like, that's, that is what a big part of what you're doing, yeah, right? Absolutely. And you know, there's in my work, I have lots of hidden moments because uh, it's my work's based on memory, right? And so memory is clear and it's unclear. It's broken and it's full. And so in my work, I have all those moments where memories are hidden and then ha- memories are in the forefront, but there's things hidden and there's yeah. bits and pieces that are broken and in pieces that are more full. So for somebody to actually kind of get that as well, right? You're like, oh yes, somebody is actually getting it. And that is huge for us as artists to get that feedback. Get my, rein my emotions back in here, Nathan. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm an emotional guy. I'm an artist. I'm a four on the Enneagram. So, uh, but you had a, you had a really fun podcast in this time as well that you got to do as an interviewee on a podcast with Mike Mm. Henley. It's called drawing inspiration with Mike Henley. Like talk about that experience. How did that happen? How did it come about? And, and tell us that story. That was really fun. That that was a neat experience to be asked by Mike, who I, uh, I got to know back in the, uh, in the clubhouse days. If any, if any of you artists hopped on clubhouse during the, the period of time that that was an active, (laughs) active, it was great for a good, you know, year and a half. It was, it was really cool, but I met a lot of artists that way, uh, became aware of him, his work and his podcast and became a fan, you know, of, 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 of the podcast. So to be asked to be a guest was, was really cool. And that was, I've been on a couple of others as well, but that was definitely the one where I feel like, yeah, I just felt the best about mm. like, kind of how I told my my backstory and kind of how I got to to be here. So, if anyone is is curious, that's we'll, we'll link to that as well. But that's that's uh, I I went pretty deep on 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 the work, you know what happened in the in the twenty years between you know last making yeah. art that has now given me the space to to tell those stories and to communicate. Um, and process, you know, what the twists and turns that life took, you know, for me, but that was, that was really neat. Well, and that, was, that was really fun to, to be heard that way. Talk, being able to talk about our art, our whys, our hows uh, are so important for us, for artists, because we need to practice talking about yeah. our art. We need the practice. Yeah. So suggestions for the artists out there, 
do live Instagrams with other artists that you know. Because if, if you're not at the point where you're going to have a podcast reaching out to you and saying, hey, would you come on for an interview? Do your own things, right? It's the same thing with showing your work. If you're not in the gallery world yet, find ways to show your work at coffee shops, at cafes, at restaurants. Ask somebody if you can borrow a room in their building and do a show and invite people. It's the same thing with the experience of talking about our work. We want to be able to express our work in a way that is short, not too long-winded, so that when we do have a show and we're asked to give an artist talk at the gallery, we've practiced and we feel comfortable. And a lot of us may not like speaking in public. So if you can practice with an artist friend on an Instagram live where you know people are watching you, but they're not in the room with you, it's great practice for you to learn how to talk about and express what you're trying to do with your work for the moment someday that you get asked to do an artist talk or be on a podcast or be interviewed by somebody. Practice, practice, practice is massive. It's so good to have those experiences. Huge. Repetition always yeah. wins and all reps count. Absolutely. There's a difference between, we'll go back to, to be in, uh, you know, jocks for a second, but in, in the sports, you know, space, like every repetition matters and consequential repetitions in a game situation, you know, are, are heavier. They I mean, they, they mean more in the moment, but those practice reps at the field, in the studio, when no one's watching, it's all a version of, you know, muscle memory. It's all, all, all that, all that experience counts and it adds up and it prepares us for whatever might be coming next. So we can wait until the opportunities present yeah. themselves, or we can create situations where we get to at least get closer to being ready for, you know, whatever might come, you know, when it does. I think that what you just shared it's probably a good place for us to to sort of begin to to wind down as we talk about just just the work, you know, tangible takeaways from our studio practice. I mean, I think that uh, a huge part, you know, for me anyway, and I suspect for most artists is just figuring out like, how do I go about doing this? Yeah. You know, like what's the, the best, you know, what's the optimal way? There's no right or wrong way. That's why we love art. There's there's no, you know, black and white answer. But how do we do it in a way? How do we continue to evolve our practice in a way that pushes the work forward and helps us to, I guess, evolve and grow as quickly as as possible? Because that that for me is uh, of the things that I think about around my my artistic practice. One of the biggest is how can I accelerate my progression? And I asked you that during the mentorship mm -hmm. program. <laughs> you know, you're like, how can I? And that's just kind of how, how I'm wired three on the Enneagram with, with the four wing, uh, for those of you <laughs> that know about all that, but I just, uh, how can I, how can I get better as fast as, you know, but, but really just thinking about how can I accelerate my progression? How can I, how can I push the work forward? What can I do? And I think that, you know, for me, it's a matter of just paying attention to what works mm -hmm. for you and, and what doesn't. I'll give an example. One of the biggest things that I learned in between my first and, and, and second show and, and really lean into the, these last couple couple months preparing for, for this current one is how affected I am by the space that I'm yeah. in. And I, that's probably true for all of us. We're, we're visual animals, right? So for me, I, I just, I realized I had this moment in the studio where I had a dozen different works in progress all sort of sitting out on the wall, which looks cool when you take a studio shot. <laughs> Um, and I still have moments where like that actually is a practical thing for me to do. But I found that if it's out and visible, I'm, I can't look at something that's in process without immediately, whether consciously or subconsciously going to work, trying to solve whatever problem is hanging out there or trying to resolve whatever, you know, how to apply, you know, whatever idea comes to mind which is great if I'm going to be working on that particular right. piece. If I'm not though, it's, it's, it's draining the battery. We all, we all have a finite amount of, you know, mental and emotional, you know, resources, physical, uh, during the day, you know, to, to work with. So for me, I realized if I'm not intending to possibly work on, on a piece, I put it out of my hmm. line of sight. So yeah. that, that also applies to material. Like for me, my palette is not colors. My palette is, is material, right. some of which I've, I've worked and some of which I, I haven't. So for me to have all of my entire palette of materials, you know, visible to have the, the, the hay bale net netting, the packing plastic, the, the rusted metal, the copper wire, like yeah. all of the, the random stuff that I, that I might be applying 
to a particular piece is really important for me to have that organized and labeled because I mean, I, I'm a pretty simple, simple creature. Like when I have, when I see messes, when I see disorganization in my visual space, yeah. I can't, like, I'm just not, I've <laughs> had an a, um, artist visit my studio a little while back and, and he's like, man, you are super organized. And I said, the only, by necessity, yeah, it's because I'm so disorganized, yeah. you know, up here, I have to have, and I get, I get yellow duct tape and I use a black Sharpie. <laughs> Those are my yeah. labels. <laughs> like it's, and it's not, it's it, whatever version of, of call it what you want. But that is, that is for me, one of the things I've learned again, just by paying right. attention. So that what I'm talking about specifically may or may not apply to, to you. But I think that if there's a takeaway for this, for people listening, it's just pay attention to what works and try new things, not just with your artwork, but around your artistic practice yeah. Because the process is what leads to, right, the outcome, the results sure. that we're excited about. So just thinking about how can I optimize my space? How can I optimize my time? How can I optimize my practice to be able to, you know, create the most authentic work that is true to who you are and what you're trying to say? There's some incredible takeaways from there. And I want to piggyback on what you said with some takeaways of my own for that reason. And I'm going to give two examples as well. But number one, make, 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 right? We talk about that all the time. That's why the podcast is called Just Make Art. Because at the end of the day, if you're not doing that, nothing else is going to follow. So just make we art. We didn't think through a lot, but we did we think did through th our title. Think through the title. Yeah. So <laughs> make art, experiment, play, try new things. Don't be afraid. Number two, yeah. look at a lot of art. Read, watch study oh i just made the balloon thing go up so that'll be incredible on youtube because i just did the peace sign on my phone and balloons <laughs> um so look at work go to galleries go to museums do those things yeah you should get some too hopefully and number number three don't be afraid to put your work out there don't be afraid to get out there so a couple things with that i go to the museum of fine arts houston all the time because i'm a member there just to key up that story, where do you want to be with your art someday? Get involved there. Is it in the gallery scene? Go to shows. Go to every show. What gallery do you want to be in? Go to every single one of their shows. If you want to be in the museum world, find ways to get into the museum world. I go to the Museum of Fine Arts regularly, and I do little reels when I'm there about the work, and I talk about it. Well, I got a random email one day from the PR director of the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. Would you like to come to all of our director's previews? with the curators, with the artist, with small group of people, 20 to 30 people. And so now I get to go do that because I was showing up and doing reels and giving them love and talking about the work. I got an invitation to do that. I never thought I'd be able to do that with the director of the museum and the curators and people like Philip Gustin's daughter and the curators of his show, those type of things. It's exciting for me. And I get to rub elbows with journalists and writers and things. And it's part of the game. We have to rub elbows and network, putting your work out there, find ways to get your work seen by others. Even if you're doubting yourself, sometimes I'm in a group with the amazing art critic, Patty Johnson, who I've followed since her days with art fag city years ago, the blog that was one of my favorites. And in this network, we had the ability to share our work in a slideshow with the director, Miles McInerney of the Miles McInerney Gallery in New York. It's got four galleries there. And there's 280 people share, putting work in this slide. And he was going to choose a handful of those to discuss for a minute, each, each artist. And he was only going to choose, I think, 25 or 30 artists. And I got onto the slideshow and I went to put my work in and I started looking at everybody's work. And I went, I don't have a chance for him to even see mine. My work is so below everybody here. I mean, I was blown away by the sculptors, uh, the visual artists, the painters that were putting work in this slideshow that's a part of this network with Patty. And I thought, no way he will ever see my work. Well, I went ahead and put two paintings in. A couple weeks later, when they did the online review of work, I would, my work was one of the artists selected in there. And I couldn't yeah. believe it. So it's like... And not that my work was better than anybody else's in there, because I still feel like I wasn't even close to anybody in that in those slides. But for some reason, his eyes and what he liked, I stuck out to him. If I had not put my work in, out there, he wouldn't have had the chance to maybe see it. The beautiful thing right. about art is somebody likes your work. Somebody likes your work. 
There is somebody out there that will love what you do and love what you create and love what you're making. So never be shy about putting your work out there. And you're never going to know who. You'll Until never know who they get a chance to see. Right? It. It's like you, yeah. Nathan, with another gallery in Taylor in Denver. You didn't know. He sent, hey, we'd love, we're opening a gallery. Love for you to show. I've had plenty of those moments. You don't know who's watching. So you need yeah. to be acting like people are watching you if you're an artist. Yep. Yeah. And, and again, just, you know, don't believe everything that you think. Yeah. I, my, my practice is to not believe most of what right. I Just think. keep grinding, keep <laughs> you know, putting so, it out there, keep yeah, rolling. Yeah. Um, it's funny yeah. that, that, that's actually the same way that, um, that the, the, uh, museum, ta the, oh, yeah, the, the still uh, museum, the Clifford still yeah. museum. That's how that social media, um, takeover came to be was putting my work out there, having visited the museum, you know, multiple yeah. times, tagging them on posts. Right. So just whatever edifying and, and, and reinforcing, you know, what you were sharing before, like that's how that stuff yeah. happens. So they reached out and asked if I'd like to be the featured artist for March yeah. to do their social media takeover. And that's kind of how that all, how that all came about. But I, I think it's important to maybe land our plane with just, actually you had something in mind. I cut you off just now. Yeah. I was just going to say, as we start and go back and check out our last episode, which was on Clifford still. And Nathan is at the Clifford still museum in Denver doing his half of the interview. So, uh, and I talk about how jealous I am in that. So I don't have to re reiterate that. But I think, what do you have coming up for the rest of the year uh, yourself, Nathan? Do you have anything on the horizon? Is there anything you're looking forward to that's coming up for the rest of 2024? Nothing concrete. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to discuss anything that's not yeah. <laughs> in, in, uh, in, in black and white. I think what I'm, what I'm most excited about though, for the rest of this year and going forward is just continuing to pull the thread on the veins, plural, the veins of yeah. work that really is, is stirring my soul, you know, right, yeah. right now. I think that that's a, again, back to what you said before, just make art and make a lot of it. That's one of the tremendous advantages of making, as I have the last couple shows, way more work than I needed, or let me rephrase, starting yeah. way more work than I needed is that I'm coming back. I, I came back, you know, to a studio full of another, I mean, I've got, I don't know, probably 15, 18 pieces that just didn't quite yeah. push themselves across the finish line or, you know, raise their hand quite as urgently or excitedly as, as the others that made it, but that I'm really excited to dive back into now with a little bit more space between with some new ideas, some new tools in my, in my, in my toolkit to really, to really get after. So that's, that's awesome. what I'm most excited about is, is, um, getting back to work on the things that are already down the line and, and just kind of seeing where they go. Love it. You? Yeah, I've got a lot coming up. I'm a little in the weeds right now prepping for a solo exhibition in Austin. Uh, that is through my dealer in Houston, Monart, and Jennifer Monteleone, uh, curating a wonderful show at All Saints Gallery that will be running the month of April while I am gone because I have a month-long residency in Newfoundland at the Pooch Cove residency that is run by the James Beard Gallery with some of our really good friends, which is going to be really exciting. Yeah. So for a month, there will be eight of us at the Pooch Cove residency, and we have an exhibition at the end through the James Beard Gallery. So excited about that to just get out in the furthest east, northeast region of North America on the cliffs. Uh, with the salt water and snow blowing and icebergs floating by making art with a group of dear friends. And yeah, there's a few other things coming up that I'm excited about affordable art fair, Austin in May. So I've got kind of a little sprint for the next few months. So I, I've been stretching work constantly, shipping work, getting ready for the art carrier to come Friday and then hop in a plane to Canada. So I've got a lot going on and I'm excited for it. That's exciting. I would be remiss if I didn't share that my current uh, solo exhibition yes. is on view through the end of April. That which remains is the name of the show. It'll be on view at another gallery in Denver at 345 Santa Fe Drive Perfect. In, uh, in Denver through the end of, uh, of April as well. Well, we have what we think is a really fun season ahead. So I hope you enjoyed this special break in our episodes just for Nathan and I to say, this is what we're doing. This is who we are as you get to know us better. And we've got some really fun things coming up this season. And I know we shared, well, actually Russell Tovey talked about Keith Herring in the podcast, a little interview about me there for a minute. And Nathan and I have been discussing a, a really fun Keith Herring episode sometime this season that will be coming. And I'm a huge Keith fan. 
We so, may or may not read the new book that came out, but yeah. I think we got the gist of it. Yeah, who knows? But <laughs> anyways, yeah. fun stuff yeah. coming. Go make art. Uh, find us on Instagram. Let us know what you think about what we're doing here with the podcast and leave us a review or a comment wherever you listen or watch on YouTube. And we will see you soon. We did not know what we were doing the first season. We still don't, but we're slightly less clueless now than yeah, ever before. Slightly. So stay tuned for more of whatever this is. Slightly. <laughs> How now, Brown? How? Unique New York. <laughs> <laughs>